Hello there and welcome to the latest online offering from the Edinburgh Fortean Society. My name is Gordon Rutter and I'm the organiser of the group. For those of you who don't know us, we normally meet on the second Tuesday of the month at 7.30 and we're trying to keep that going in the current climate by releasing these videos at exactly that time. Um, tonight we're going to have a speaker who has been a, a not quite a lifelong member, but a founding member of the Edinburgh Fortean Society. But just before I introduce this evening's speaker, uh, next month for July the 14th, we're going to have a welcome return from Richard Freeman. And Richard is a cryptozoologist, a member of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and he's going to be talking to us about his adventures in cryptozoology. But it's going to be an interview, it's going to be a a talk it's going to be an option for you to ask questions of him because the interview will be recorded in advance I would ask you to um, get the questions to me as quickly as possible if you look in the comments box immediately below this video you'll see that we've got the website for the Edinburgh Fortune Society you can submit questions through the email uh, contact details there we've got the Facebook group you can submit details there we've got the Twitter group you can submit details there we've got a meetup group you can't submit details there but you can find details about all future meetings at some point when this is all over we hope to be able to to return to our, our natural venue which is a pub so I hope you've all got a, a glass or two to keep your company tonight obviously all of those uh, different social media that I've just mentioned there those are the ways to keep in contact with us and those are where we put all of our information so tonight's speaker is going to be Stu Smith and as I say he was a founder member of the Edinburgh Fortean Society he's been, a, he's been a lifelong Fortean and tonight he's going to be talking to us about folklore from the Shetlands so ladies and gentlemen Stuart Smith the music of the trows hello folks today I'm going to uh, talk to you about the music of the trows the little people of the Shetland Isles but I thought at first I'd start off with telling you a little bit about Shetland, its history and some of the folklore from the area. So starting off with geography, the Shetland Isles are the most northerly of the British Isles uh, and they're lying about 100 miles north northwest of the uh, Scottish mainland. There's about 100 islands and about 15 are inhabited. So I come from Unst which is the most northerly inhabited island in the archipelago and also the most northerly inhabited island in, in the UK. Um, the largest um, settlement on Unst is Baltasound, which is uh, where I grew up. Um, and it's somewhere, well, the house I grew up is somewhere under this cloud here marked with the pin. So Shetland has a apparently been populated since at least 200 BC but or BC um, but probably possibly much earlier the tourist board claimed depending on what website you looked at about 6,000 or 5,000 years of human inhabitation um, not much is known about the original inhabitants except that they built some magnificent 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 stone brocks such as this one on Musa which is the the most well preserved um, in Shetland the most norm normally commonly referred to as Picts, but it's unclear how closely they uh, related they were to the Picts of mainland Scotland, um, and definitely not to these alleged Picts. I don't know if they had any, uh, if they were the painted ones like the Romans called them, with the elaborate uh, body tattoos or paintings with woad. Um, it's it's not clear about that. So whether they've really got that much to do with um, uh, the the Picts from the rest of the uh, British Isles. Around about the 9th century CE, uh, the Vikings swapped occasional raids of Shetland's coasts for permanent occupation, and the islands came under the occupation of the Kingdom of Norway. I'm not sure if they arrived like this in the traditional uh, dragon boats or the silly horned helmets that uh, we have the traditions of. Um, the Shetland tradition of Apelia, you know, most people wear the uh, helmets with the raven wings on it if they're in the Jarl squads, uh, the the, uh, the main squad of uh, uh, men dressed as in 
well, whether it's traditional Viking costume or not. Um, I think most people think of Vikings looking like this nowadays from the TV show. What did happen was that the Norwegians or the Vikings replaced the indigenous pop population who effectively disappeared. Um, and most of the present population, or many of the present population rather, are descended from uh, those Norsemen and women. Norwegian rule of Shetland lasted for several hundred years until 1469, when they were pawned to Scotland by this man, Christian I of Denmark and Norway, to raise money to pay a dowry to the Scottish king, James III, for his daughter, Margaret. There's a clause in that contract that's supposed to allow the Norwegian crown uh, to reclaim the islands for 210 kilograms of gold. It's been tested several times, but without success, as Scotland effectively annexed the islands in 1471. Scots gradually supplanted the Nor uh, Western Norse dialect known as Norn, but there's a great many words from that language uh, survive as part of the Shetland dialect of Scots. Since the 1970s, North Sea Oil has made the islands relatively wealthy as the council negotiated a, a healthy cut of every, every barrel of oil that passed through the massive Sulumvo oil terminal. So let's move on to things that are more relevant to the Fortean society, shall we? I'm going to talk a bit about the fishing folklore here. Um, <clears throat> unlike the Orkney Islands that are further south, the Shetland soil is relatively poor for ag agriculture. Until we got modern methods of farming and uh, most importantly fertilizers, the sea was the main source of food and for produce to sell. Unsurprisingly, therefore, there's a lot of folklore associated with the sea and with fishing. Up until the end of the 19th century, Shetland fishermen went to the deep water fishing or the far half in small clinker built boat, boat, boats known as saxerines, as they have six oars with a man on each. So there's a few, to, this is a, 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 an original uh, model of these. So before 1830, these boats were all of a similar model, prefabricated in Norway and shipped to mainland, uh, to Shetland as numbered boards where they were built. There are very few trees on Shetland that was wooded before humans and most importantly sheep arrived. So wood was either imported or collected as driftwood. There's a place near to my father's, where my father's family came from on the west coast of Unst that's actually called Woodwick because a quirk of the Atlantic currents means that it gets more than its fair share of flotsam. Getting back to the boats, the boards were studied carefully by men with special knowledge who could tell how well the bo boards would hold together in the final bo boat. They could also tell the fortune of the boats from knots in the wood. Some knots were misformed and could lead to a boat sinking, while others were windy knots and would attract bad weather. Boards with these in them would be rejected, as would any, be, any with watery swirls. However, there were also good knots resembling local fish, and these would bless a, a boat with a good catch. Fishermen had to learn a whole new language before they went to sea. Many words used on land were taboo on the boat, and this was beaten into the young men. Many of the words used at sea were Norse, or may even have come from the pre-Scandinavian language of the Laps or sorceress Finns, which we'll come back to. Other rituals were observed when preparing bait or leaving to go to sea such as not being observed leaving or avoiding certain people or animals. The list of signs of bad luck that could lead to a superstitious fisherman to stay at home includes cats, rats, otters, ministers, and red-headed women, especially cross-eyed red-headed women. Fishing lines were always shot over the starboard or lineboard set of the side of the boat, and caught fish would never be counted. The boat shouldn't be washed at sea as it would wash away the luck, and a fisherman would can never come back to land totally dry. I think that these are still observed by some sea anglers. So we'll move on to sea monsters and water beasties. So as you might imagine, the seas around Shetland have quite a few sea monsters. Uh, the most common of these was probably the, the Brigdi, a fearsome monster with huge fins that which could envelop a small boat and drag it to the depths. The Brigdi was mo greatly feared by small boat fishermen who would be driven ashore by the presence of these ferocious creatures. The Brigdi's fins could apparently be used to mimic a sail to get close to their victims in the guise of another boat. Axes were uh, often carried so that the fins of the monster could be chopped off, and it was said that on at least on one occasion the fishermen attacked the beast with such ferocity that their boat was almost filled with bits of fin. Some now think that this is the most uh, likely candidate for this animal is the harmless basking shark, which doesn't necessarily fit. Um, maybe an orca as well or something? 
this picture shows another strange beast, which was maybe a Baskin shark, though the, 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 the legs, which look like something like a lion or something like that, are a bit weird. Other denizens of the deep included the seifer, a coffin-shaped whale of some sort. This animal was in the habit of jumping clear of the water. Um, I think this is a humpback, probably. Um, and if it was said that if it fell in one direction, it meant death to men, and in another direction, death to fish. Um, the more conventional sea monster is also represented by the seafan, a Loch Ness monster, uh, Loch Ness type creature, consisting of a series of humps and a long neck, or a sea serpent. Though gigantic, this particular monster seemed to be relatively harmless. In fact, a sighting around the start of the summer fishery was regarded as an omen of a good summer to come. In the summer of 1882, however, the crew of the fishing boat Bertie encountered a less amenable monster just southeast of the island of Fettler. This creature was described as 150 feet long with a huge head covered in barnacles the size of herring barrels and with seven foot long whiskers made of bright green seaweed. The boat was pursued at high speed by this beast for three hours and the crew reported that the ballast stones thrown at it bounced off its nose like marbles. A double charge of swan, swan shot from a fouling piece kept on board that ever had a deterrent effect and the crew made it safely to shore badly shaken by their ordeal. There are also creatures of freshwater locks and burns on the islands, such as the Nuckel. These once inhabited the streams under Shetland's many little water mills. Ruins of these mills can be seen in many places, but the Nuckel seems to have departed when they fell from use. <coughs> it was apparently a water horse, which took the form of a splendid Shetland pony. It used to hide under the mills and stop the wheel or turtle from turning by rubbing its back against it. The only way to get rid of this annoyance was to show a, throw a burning pit down into the, a peat, sorry, I shouldn't use the Shetland pronunciation now, down into the area where the wheel sat, known as the underhus. The nuchal, however, had a more nuisance value and, if, and would, if given the opportunity, entice weary travellers to sit on its back, then rush into the nearest loch where they would be drowned. I think that's kind of like the Kelpie. Visitors to Shetland would be wise to think twice before accepting lifts from strange ponies. The maritime equivalent of the trows, which we'll get to eventually, were the fin folk, creatures of considerable magic, uh, magical resource who could row 50 miles with one pull of the oars and had the power to cure all ills. Shetland fins are unlike their Orkney counterparts, counterparts who seem to have much of the mermaid in them. Shetland fins are ab above all else, powerful sorcerers who can change into sea monsters at the wink of an eye and will chase fishing boats and pull them down under the waves. The only chance for survival is to throw some silver at the pursuing pack. Fins, it would appear, are so enamoured of silver that they will immediately fall to fighting over it and your boat will have a chance to escape. Mermaids fe feature little in Shetland, being mentioned in a mere one or two stories, but seal keys are another matter. The idea of seals who can take human form by shedding their skin is known all over the world, or at least in Scotland anyway. The usual story tells of a man who steals the skin of a seal woman who then marries him. She eventually finds her seal skin, perhaps with supernatural help or the help of their uh, children, and turns to her life in, her, in the sea. The seal folk were always supposed to be very handsome in, student, in human form. And an alternative to the usual tales tells that a human woman would summon a seal lover by shedding seven tears into the sea at high tide. These liaisons are often supposed to have borne fruit and certain families are th thought to have a drop of silky blood in them. Perhaps they're still around. In the 18th century and earlier, the Northern Isles were thought to be infested with witches by many people across Europe who were afraid to visit for fear of malign influence. Apart from the sorceress Finns I mentioned before, the usual Shetland witch was the wise woman, a healer who derived her powers from communion with the trows. In Norse times, someone accused of using witchcraft for evil uses could defend themselves by getting six people of good standing to swear to their innocence, known as a sextarith, or sixfold oath. Later on, Scottish influence brought, uh, brought religious witch trials and the idea that witches got their power from the devil rather than from the little people. The usual crime of witchcraft involved taking the profit from someone else's craft, meaning that their milk would not churn to butter, for example. All of the goodness of their produce would flow instead to the witch's land. The witch would gain this influence by taking grass from the roof of the barn used by the cattle, and there are various ways of defending yourself from a witch. One tale tells of a farm where the cattle would not give milk and were seen to go to a, uh, a local woman when, he, when she passed. 
The crofter filled a bottle with urine from one of the cows and stoppered it tightly. The next day the woman came to the farm to beg him to open the bottle as she had been unable to pass water for 12 hours and was in terrible pain. We'll have a little bit more about wise women and trows later on. So one of the stranger beasties in Shetland folklore is the wolver, a hairy humanoid with a wolf's head. Unlike a traditional werewolf, this isn't a shape changer, but some sort of immortal spirit. It's not really considered dangerous unless provoked. They show generosity by leaving some of their catch for poor families. The Shetland folklorist Jesse Saxby wrote, The wolver was a creature with a, uh, like a man with a wolf's head. He had short brown hair all over him. His home was a cave dug out of the side of a steep now halfway up a hill. He didn't molest folk if folk didn't molest him. He was fond of fishing and had a small rock in the deep water, which is known to this day as the Wolverstein or Wolfstone. There he would sit fishing silics and piltics, so that's the abundant local fish that you can catch from the shore, uh, for hour after hour. He was reported to have uh, frequently left a few fish on the windowsill of some, some poor body. So Miss Saxby lived in the house called Wolver Wolver's Hole on Unst, which is very close to where I grew up, but it's not clear if she was interested in this myth because of the name of the house, or if she named the house uh, after an interest in the Wolver myth. And uh, I was reminded of this, to put this into the talk uh, recently, by um, Ed Fort's own Scott Lyle, who's recently published a Fortean and folklore zine called Wolver's Stain, and we'll try and get the link for that in the notes for this event. So. Still not got anywhere near the trows. I'm going to talk about a haunted house briefly before I get to that. So this is the most haunted house in Shetland, the Wind House on the island of Yell, which is the next island south from uh, Unst. One of the best known of all Shetland folk tales is the Trow of Wind House or the Trow of Yell. So trows are the local fairy folk, but the trow in the tale is nothing like these norm the, the ones that we're going to talk about later. So unlike those who are little people or slim types capable of passing for human, this one was a huge mountain of gelatinous blubber, which sounds a little bit Lovecraftian. So it goes back to about the mid-1800s at latest. The versions all agree on this part. Christmas Eve, a shipwrecked sailor makes his way to the wind house and finds the family packing up to spend the night elsewhere because every Christmas Eve, horrible things happen and someone winds up dead. Maybe some, something like other people's uh, family holidays. So they invite him to go away with them, but he stays in the house alone instead, not being scared and maybe interested in the silver that they might have left behind. <clears throat> so a giant monstrous creature attacks the house in the night and he grabs his faithful axe, um, which was with him since the shipwreck, and rather surprising, and gives chase outside. He buries his axe in the giant and kills it. He sees it on the ground, ground there, not but a ha shapeless mass. The family is very happy to see him alive on Christmas Day, and he points out where he killed it. The, the heather there had turned bright green, and the spot is supposedly still known to the locals. In one version, there's an actual fence around it. So there's a bunch of other less well-documented ghost stories, such as one about a lady in silk believed to be a housekeeper or mistress who fell down the stairs and broke her neck. There's an unsubstantiated rumour of a woman's skeleton found on the floorboards at the foot of the stair in the house. So there's another one about a tall man's ghost in a long black coat, possibly connected to the actual substantiated body on the site. And a newspaper story from 1887 says, Human remains found. While some workmen who were engaged repairing the manor house of Windhouse were removing some debris from the back of the house, they came upon the skeleton of a human being. It had apparently been that of a man of large stature as the bones measured fully six foot long. It was lying in the position it had been put down with the arms folded over the breast. It was only a small distance under the ground, and there was no evidence of there ever being a coffin, which gave rise to an opinion that it had been a murder. But if uh, it's not been in the memory of any of the inhabitants, nor does any remember any person being missed. One of the archive transcripts said it was thought it was someone who'd disappeared at a workman's party. And then finally, there's another report of a, a baby skeleton found in a kitchen wall. So even without this, and the bodies, the house had a pretty strange history. There was an earlier house higher up on the hill in the 1600s, owned by a s series of pretty nasty men, um, accused of lying, beating, cheatings, hangings, probably the lairds of the area. The current house ruin represents a reconstruction of the old one from about 1700 something, done by moving the stones down the hillside. 
supposedly the foundations of the original are still visible, um, but I've never been up there to, to have a look. Um, must be a bit of a coward. I've never actually been further than the gatehouse. Uh, the gatehouse on the road is now a camping lodge where you can stay for um, a few pounds a night. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the price. I, I did this talk originally in 2008, so most of the, this uh, information may be a little bit out of date. As are these pictures. Uh, the roof is completely collapsed on the building, um, so it's all only the, the sort of um, gables of the windows at the front that's uh, kind of visible. It's a very, very striking house. It's um, You can see it from the main road as you go past it, going, from, going through Yell to get to uh, Unst, um, and uh, it, it always it used to be something that would give me a little bit of a, a frisson of uh, fear when I saw it going past as a kid. And that's maybe why I never actually ever, ever went up up there. Um, you know, people talk about going and staying the night up there and things like that. Um, so the farmhouse on the land opposite on the road um, was occupied by one of the amateur Yale historians who wrote an eight part history of the 1600s house and house owners in a local magazine uh, two decades ago, which I've never actually seen either. So it's been derelict for a long time, since the 1920s. Um, back in 2003, the BBC reported it had been bought, I think, by the people who actually had the gatehouse and ran it as the, as the um, bothy. Um, and they were going to renovate it, but nothing, nothing happened. It's, it's in a, even more of a ruin now uh, than it ever was. So let's get to the main talk of this, the land of the trows, the music of the trows. Um, uh, so... This is, uh, I don't know if you can see the trows in this picture here. Um, if you look a little bit closely at the bottom of the picture, you can maybe spot them. When the Norwegians came to Shetland, uh, they brought their giants and their trolls with them. Uh, these creatures of the mountains and fjords changed in, in uh, the lower, more rounded landscape of hills and vows that make up in the isles. The giants disappeared after making their mark with standing stones thrown, thrown at one another during their endless battles while the tra trolls became the diminutive trows. Um, there's a story about their interactions that might explain uh, why, the, why the giants left. So I've got a few stories here that I'm going to read out um, from a couple of books, which I'll reference uh, towards the end of here, if I can find this story. Okay. So this is the giant and the trows. Okay. Once upon a time, a giant lived in the Kames, that's the range of the hills in Nesting and Delting, and this giant could get no peace because of the trows. They would go climbing over him and creep into his ears and pull his eyebrows. This went on until he made up his mind that he would not put up with it. He would make a huge creel of straw and carry them over to Norway. So he began to make a creel, and it was so wide at the bottom that there were four or five score of meshes in it. What do you think? Wouldn't there have been a fine... Few, a lot of handfuls of straw in that one, my precious. When he had finished the creel, he went out one fine moon, uh, moonlight night to the place in the Kems where they were always in the habit of coming, and he scooped them all with his hands into the creel and pushed the cord along the top uh, so that they couldn't get out. But he had made the creel so big that he wasn't able to get it onto his back, so he thought he would drag it to the top of a hill and gradually lift it from there. He nearly tore, tore a hole in the creel, dragging it over the earth, and when he put it, put the carrying band over his shoulders and rose to his full height, the bottom came right out of the creel and out came the trows, wriggling like silics. This overbalanced him so that he nearly fell his length upon the ground. He came down upon one knee and where his knee fell there's a gap in the hills that people still called knee fell. Or well, probably knee fell in the old Shetland uh, pronunciation. His other foot made a great gash in the earth and when that gash filled up with water there was a lock. If you look at the petawater, You'll see where he set his foot, for the marks of all the toes are still there. What happened to the giant, I cannot rightly say. But I think he went to Norway to get some peace. And to this day, in the fine moonlit nights of harvest, the trows come out, and they sing and they laugh and they dance at Unpetawata. The same as they did on that night that they escaped from the giant. So, the trows moved into low mounds that were created by human hands in prehistory or by the actions of glaciers. One description of these little people say, The fairies are thought to be short in stature, with small faces and a yellow complexion. They have red eyes and green teeth. They dress uniformly in dark grey, and both sexes wear murit gloves. 
so murut is uh, the um, for a brown sheep or a black sheep is a murut sheep in Shetland dialect. So there's a number of different types of trows apart from the Finns that we mentioned earlier. There's the typical hill folk that we saw before who feature in most of the stories and then there are household sprites um, similar to the Bruni. They're very similar to the brownies of Scottish folklore who will tend to the kitchen in exchange for room and board. Possibly the strangest type of trow is the kunal or king trow. These tragic creatures have no females and must steal a human wife in order to breed. The unfortunate woman invariably, die, invariably dies in childbirth, as does the Kunal Trau when his single son comes of age. Any King Trau who tries to avoid this fate by refusing to take a wife is eventually exiled from the Trau land under the hills. Born of the union of a particular Kunal Trau and a human witch are two spirits known as the Finis uh, or Fainis and the Gangfer. These are similar to the Doppelganger and predict deaths by appearing in the likeness of a person who is not long for this earth. Sometimes the relationship between trows and men is good, and the trows would seek out human musicians to play at their celebrations or human midwives to help with difficult births. The men and women employed in this manner were usually richly rewarded with gifts of money or occasionally magic pots of medicinal ointment that would never run dry. We'll talk a lot more about the musicians at the end, but to start off I have a few tales of midwives or howdies as they were known in Shetland dialect. One unfortunate howdy from Lunaness on the Shetland mainland was summoned by the trows of the island of Hwalza and set out with two um, kits or covered bowls of food for the patient. It was a stormy night and she hesitated to board the boat. According to the story, this so exasperated the trows that they transformed her and her two kits into stone. The three stones still stand on the, on the, co on the shore as a warning to those who would hesitate to obey the trows. So another tr tale of trows and midwives appears in uh, many different forms across Shetland. So I'm going to try and find that one for you. Uh, just a minute. Okay. So, uh, one evening as she was returning to her home in Bressa, uh, to returning to her home, a woman in Bressa, which is the island that's next to the main town in Shetland um, um, of Lerwick, uh, was overtaken by a man who entreated her to come to the aid of his wife who was in labour. The woman demurred at first because the man was an entire stranger. He appeared so anxious and was so insistent, however, that she laterally consented to go with him. After the child had been born and was being washed, the father handed the woman a pot of ointment and requested that the contents should be rubbed on the infant. This the woman did, but during the process her right eye itched and she rubbed it with her finger to relieve the irritation. The following summer, the woman was at the craw, that's an enclosure for uh, sheep or um, uh, planting crops out on the hill, uh, ruin, which is removing the wool, the Shetland uh, sheep are traditionally you don't shear them you pull the wool off uh, that's ruin so she was there along with other neighbors and she saw the same man again he was going along among the sheep plucking a handful of wool or ooh from each one of them when he became opposite the woman uh, she spoke to him this seemed to surprise him very much and he wanted to know which eye she had seen him with when she informed him he immediately blew his breath into that eye after that, the woman was no longer able to see the trows, I think, or anything else as well. So that's an illustration from a local cartoonist smirk for that. Um, so yeah, I think it was that the ointment had given her the, the ability to see the trows. So it's another famous story is the good man of Taft. Um, I'm going to find, try and find that one as well. Let's see. So this is somebody who had a special relationship with the trows. Let's find the first story here. Okay, so this is called the trow shearing or shearing. The habit of taking the good men of Taft at his word whenever he expressed a wish involving uh, suitable conditions seemed to have been prevalent among the trows. As the good man began to feel the comforts of prosperity, he became most anxious about his crops, which are unusually heavy. In Shetland, oats and barley are generally cut down with reaping hooks. The folk consider in that way they are able to handle the grain more carefully and that it does not get shaken and dirtied by being thrown down as it would if it were being mowed with scythes. This is important in the case of grain intended for the mill. The native process is the disadvantage of being certainly the slower of the two, except when there are many hands. One after, uh, autumn, the goodman of Taft was very solicitous about the safety of a barley rig, which would have, been, uh, would have been cut down, which he had not managed to get at because of other work. 
As he sat by the fire one night after a hard hearse day, hearse is the local word for autumn, he, suddenly, uh, he said suddenly in his anxiety, I wish where Suthrig was still, it was bit sand and it is stooks. So that's um, putting it up into the um, uh, rigs. So, um, to I should go, to gear from a bonny muckle flecket coo, and I hae no another in liquor upon my act, in my possession. So what he's saying there is, I wish that my um, uh, sooth rig uh, had been cut down, and I would give my um, bonny muckle, muckle flecket coo uh, to get that to happen. Later on that same night, some folk passing uh, Taft's bear rig, uh, so that's barley rig or um, bear meal, which is the, the Shetland and Orkney uh, um, historic uh, uh, grain. They heard the trows at work on it. They stopped and listened and distinctly one her, uh, heard one say, Had at the Berkey, a band, a nidder at trave I hear yerkin. Whatever that means. I'm not sure I can translate that one. Uh, in the morning the bear was cut down and standing in the rig in stooks. And Taft's muckle flecket coo was deed. So you can see the, the trows there cutting down the barley and stealing the cow. Oh, maybe I have another one of these stories to say. Wait a second. Sorry, I'm a little bit disorganized. Okay, so the fairy pot. That's another story. Okay. The trows have been heard on several occasions milking the cows in the byre at Taft. But some among the good folk evidently did not think it right that the folk at Taft should be defrauded of their milk. One afternoon, the goodman at Taft was at a place called Yuri with butter. He was riding upon a red horse and reading, uh, leading behind him a grey one laden with the butter. As he was passing a hill called Stackerberg, he had heard a voice saying, Do rides the red and rins the grey. Ging hem and into the byre and say, Varna, Vilda, Tela Tivla. It's fan the fire and brunter. When Taft got home, he went to the buyer and carefully repeated the words that he had heard. Which was, Varna vivla, tela tivla, it's fan i the fire and brunter. As soon as he had done so, the trow that had been operating on the cows flung down a little curiously shaped brass pan on the brig stains, so that's the stones uh, bridging the drain at a cottage door, and said, O oh, care and dull, that's my bairn that's fan in the fire and brunter. The hill lady apparently went home at once, and the trows were never heard again, milking the cows in the byre or taft. The goodman took the little brass pan into the house and kept it for good luck. Every night it was carefully hung up on a nail, with a piece of flesh or some sort of food inside it, and it remained with the family for a long time. One night it was somehow neglected, and they didn't put any food into it, and next morning it had vanished, and it was never seen again. So the general attitude towards the trows was one of respect, with no little fear involved. So it's the same as the little people or the fairies all over the UK or all over uh, Europe, I guess. The trows were inveterate thieves who would steal anything not protected from them. The trows steal cattle that die suddenly of disease or in accidents, and instantly replace them with a false constructed from foul materials. Therefore, livestock that die in this manner are never eaten, which is probably a sensible thing to do if uh, a cow dies suddenly, um, that you shouldn't eat the, eat the beast. Um, and, but this could also happen with people, um, as this rather sinister story tells. So. So this comes from uh, the Folklore of Orkney and Shetland by Ernest Marwick. Um, so I'm not going to read it out in Shetland dialect, I'm going to read the uh, knap in anglicised version. <clears throat> My mother, God rest her soul, told me this, and she never would nor never uh, could have told me a lie. She was staying with friends at Kurgid and Weasdale, and one evening around twilight the master of the house was much perturbed, for his wife had just had a baby. 
And now, my dear child, what should he hear just as he was going to leave the lamb house? But three most unearthly knocks which seemed, come, seemed to come from under the ground. Now he had no idea what this could be, but he made everything fast and went into the cornyard. As he came in sight of the corn stacks, he heard a voice that said three times, Mind the crooked finger. Now his wife had a crooked finger, and he knew well that something was going to happen, but for the trows were on the watch for a helpless infant, or its mother, or both. He went into the house, lighted a candle, and took down the Bible and a steel knife. He opened the book and the knife, at which there came such a roaring and bellowing, and such an unearthly stamping and rattling and confusion from the buyer, that the whole house shook. Everyone began to quake. But he took the open Bible and went towards the buyer, with those who were in the house behind him, trembling and quaking, leaving only the midwife with the poor wife and infant. Now when he got to the door, he threw the Bible into the buyer in front of him, stuck the open knife in his mouth, edge outwards, and held the lighted candle in his hand. The instant this was done, the bellowing and noise and din ceased all of a sudden, and the image that had been prepared to take the place of the poor wife and the innocent child was all that was left in the buyer. So that's them, the trows there, making the... the um, the uh, dodgy wife. <laughs> well said the husband. He took it. He took in his arms the very likeness of his wife with the trous left in the buyer. I've taken you and I'll use you. Well, he took it into the house, the image the trous had left, and it had every joint and part of a woman. Okay. Uh, and my mother told me that she saw it. And the good people of the house and the children after them sat upon the stock or image or likeness. Things were set upon it and the wood was sawn on it. And this is as certain as I'm speaking to you, and not mere hearsay, for my mother told me to uh, told told it to me with her own lips, and she would not have told me a lie. So, children or women who fell ill with certain diseases were considered to maybe to be changelings, with the real person having been stolen by the trows. Being cursed by the trows was um, referred to as being hurt for the grund or elf shot. Wise women or trowy doctors with special knowledge of the trows could make money by recovering people stolen in this way or by healing cattle that had been um, cursed. So, we've got a couple of uh, stories about the elaborate rituals used by the healers. Uh, and the first concerns the healing of an elf shot cow. So, here we go. <coughs> A crofter in a certain parish had a, crow, cook, a cow that was supposed to be hurt for the ground, cursed by the trows. And an old woman called uh, Marin or Nortavo, a famous witch doctor, was sent for. On arriving at the house, Marin sent the good man to the seashore to procure three crabs of a kind called Kras Lipix. Meanwhile, Marin provided herself with a, a patakatar, a steel norleg, a leaf from a Bible, and a low tanned. Okay, a lowen tanned is a burning peat, a glowing peat uh, from the fire. Thus equipped, she enters the byre. The cow is resting on the busy, unable to rise or eat. Waving the firebrand, she marks or matches around the cow three times against the sun, giving the beast a severe stab at each turn with a needle. So it's the steel nodalig. The poor animal now jumps to its feet while Marin proceeds to wave the leaf of holly uh, writ over its back at the same time oh sorry the leaf of holy writ a leaf from the bible sorry i'm mis, mis, misreading it here at the same time muttering certain inaudible words in norse the firebrand is placed in the tar pot and set on the cow's head and the smoke or snooker of which excites a fit of coughing on the trembling animal a cat is now brought to the scene and set on the cow's neck and dragged by the tail three times over the cow's back I don't know how you get a cat to do that and sit still or not to scratch your hand off, but never mind. Presently, the old man arrives with the fairy crabs, and these are given in one dose, all alive and kicking. So they make the cow eat the crabs. Marin has now done her duty. The cow is delivered from the power of the throws. She leaves instructions that the ashes of the tanned and the tar that remain in the pot be made into three pills, and these are to be given the cow on... Uh, um, on its breakfast uh, on three mornings. So that's the first of our wee stories about this. Um, so the second is uh, about a woman who claimed to have been taken by the trows as a baby. 
but was delivered from their power by the skill of a famous witch doctor again. It happened this wise. When the woman, whose name was Meg, was nine months old, her mother left the child asleep in the cradle and went into the byre to milk a cow. While thus engaged, she heard the child utter a terrible scream. And rushing into the house, she found the bairn struggling and crying in the most excited manner. In vain she tried to soothe the child, and in vain she swang, sang sweet lullabies. Poor Meg cries and would not be comforted. She gets blue in the face and hoarse in the throat, and altogether so changed that even the mother cannot recognise our once thriving child. At last an old woman is brought to the house, and she declares that the bairn is hurted for the grunt. A bucket of salt water is fetched out of the breaking sea, and three four, small ebb stains, so that's um, st stones from the shoreline, from the, from the ebb is where, where below the tide mark. Uh, a large fire is put on the hearth, and the stones are placed into it. The sea water is poured into the metal meat kettle, and the stones, uh, when red hot, are thrown into it. Meg is stripped and placed in this bath. She is turned round in the kettle three times with the sun, and thrice in the opposite direction. The child is now placed on a wet blanket and passed through the flame of the peat fire three times. She is then swathed in the sheet and put to bed, after which she is burned in effigy. The mother is further instructed to uh, tig the nine mothers' mitt for the bear's, bairn's restoration. So nine mothers whose firstborn were sons are each solicited for an offering of three articles of food to be used during the convalescence of the patient who had been thus snatched from the power of the trows. Meg lived to be a good old age and often related this story of her recovery to the writer. People at risk from the trows and pregnant women could be protected by seining or blessing. This could take many forms such as crossed straws on the threshold or placing pins, knives or a Bible in the bed or cot. So I think cold iron um, is proof against the fairies. Calling on God was always the best defence against the trow. People attacked by the trows at night on the hills could drive them off by invoking the Lord. Often if they returned to the spot in daylight, they could find some trowy property dropped in haste. These items would invariably give, bring good luck to the owner. The trows would always become more active and more aggressive around Yule, that is Christmas. I'm not sure if they meant modern Christmas or old Yule, which is still celebrated in some parts of um, uh, Shetland at the old um, uh, time from the old uh, calendar, which is uh, 6th of January. They would go after food and drink, especially to supply their own celebrations. Meat could be protected by piercing it with a, a steel knife. Um, on Toilish Eve, a saint's day just before Christmas, it was thought to be the main night that the Trows would celebrate their own version of Yule. One of the stories I'll tell you later um, when I come to talk about trousers and music concerns a fiddler that was, uh, who was stolen on Toilish Eve. Before that, I want to finish up this discussion of the evil activities of trousers with a well-known story uh, of about a particularly nasty trow wife known as uh, Lucky Minnie. So let's see if I can find that one. There's Lucky Minnie. So there were four trows on the Fair Isle. There was Grotty Finney, Lucky Minnie, Tushy, and Tangi. Lucky Minnie lived in the Hoya de Head, Malcolm's Head, Ma Malcolm's Head. There was a little boy one day, and his mother had baked him a bannock. So it's like a uh, kind of like a scone, um, the Shetland version of a bannock. Um, and it was a very beautiful cake, and he did not feel like eating it. He wandered away and played with it. Now he'd been warned never to go up on the head where Lucky Minnie lived, but eventually he ended up on the head. He was rolling his cake along the floor, and the thing rolled down into Lucky Minnie's hall. He went in to get it, and she grabbed him, put him in a bag, and hung him up on the wall. And then she went out to uh, forage for something more to add to the pot. She was going to have him for dinner. The little lad had a knife in his pocket, and he cut a hole in the skin bag, it was always said to be a skin bag, and slipped out through the hole. And there was a muckle old trow dog, so the do trows kept dogs, apparently, uh, lying at the fire. First of all, the boy gathered all of the trows crockery and piled it in the bag, but it still looked a bit empty. Then he wakened the trow dog that was lying, lying snuffling at the side of the fire and persuaded him it would be a good thing to crawl into the bag. So the dog got inside and having got him in, the pretty boy put a sniffer, a twitch, a, a switch across the hole so he couldn't get out again. Then he hid for the door was locked so he couldn't get out. Presently, Lucky Minnie came back, and she took the bag off the wall and started to baste it. She walloped away at the bag, and the crockery began to crunch. 
she said, there is Bane's break. And then the dog began to howl, and she said, there he howls. And when she opened the bag, there was nothing in it but broken crockery and the trial bo dog beaten to a mummy. So she thought she better get more light on the scene. She opened the door to see what was happening, and the pity boy got out. And he started, she started pelting after him, and they gave right down the face of the heed. And it had been an uplousing, a thaw, and there was a huge burn gone, gone down. Uh, the burn that gangs out and it has to go. And the pity boy jumped the burn, but the Troy's, trial wife's fit slipped and she fell into the burn. And she gave right down the burn into has to go. Until not long ago, for has to go is a gyo inlet that fills with white scum, foam. They used to say that it was lucky mini churning butter, churning butter. So, finally we get to the title of the talk, The Trows and Music, or The Music of the Trows. So the Trows had a great love of music and dancing, but were seemingly envious of the skill of human musicians. There are many tales of fiddlers being invited to play for trowy weddings or Yule celebrations and disappearing under the hill for days or even years. One tale in the Book of Trows I have here is an account given by the sister of one man. It's too long to read here, but the basic story is of a brilliant fiddler called Tammy who was invited to play at a wedding at a settlement many miles from his own. So in those days, people would just walk over the hills to long distances over the, over the um, hills to, the, to other places, other settlements around the islands. He was safely de delivered to the celebration, but after a week, his family were very worried and began to search for him. Whole villages turned out to scour the hills along his supposed route home, but nobody, no sign was found of, for, of him. Eventually he was given up for a dead, but a year and a day after he, he left for the wedding to walk home, Tammy staggered into his own house blind drunk. After sleeping for a day or more, he was eventually capable of describing what happened to him. As he was walking through the hills, a snowstorm led, led him to shelter in the lee of a rocky outcrop. It was there he encountered a little old man dressed in grey who asked him to play at his daughter's wedding as they had no musician available. <clears throat> he was led through a door that appeared in the rock into a living space thronged with the pity folk and the old trous called Ozzy gave him some good food and drink. At, this, at some point his fiddly, fiddle was accidentally smashed but Ozzy provided him with another of excellent quality. He played for the trous wedding rant for three days before being led back out into the hills with his new fiddle and a pig or little jar of fairy liquor. A thick fog covered the land and he struggled to see his little companions. At some point he lost sight of them in the fog, uh, um, he completely lost sight and the fog lifted in an instant and he found himself alone but in a place he recognised as being close from home. Tammy fortified him with the trous liquor on the walk to the extent that he lost the jar and can remember nothing until waking at home. The jar was later found on the hill and that and the new fiddle were taken as proof of his story. The young man was later lost at sea in a big storm when many boats were sunk and at the same time the fiddle and the pig disappeared from the family's croft house. Survivors of the storm swore they saw Pat Tammy pulled from the water by a strange boat crewed by little men in grey that was seemingly unaffected by the waves. Other musicians taken by the Trows were not so fortunate to return home within a year. The tragic story of Sigurd Gord tells of a fiddler who encountered the Trows on Toilish Eve, their night of Yule celebration. They invite him to play for them and give him a draught of their liquor made from heather blossom, which he foolishly, foolishly drinks and put them, puts himself in their power. Never, never eat and drink the fairy food. As in the previous story, he returns home with a fiddle gifted to him by the trows, but only to find strangers in his house. It turns out to be Toilish Eve, but a hundred years later, and he leaves the house in despair. A young man follows him and watches Sigurd play the music taught to him by the trows. Um, as the aurora dance in the sky. Sigurd there falls dead and rots away as the effects of a century of time take their toll. So hopefully this is going to come through on the video, but this is the song that he played.
Okay, so there's lots of trowy tunes. Um, Sigurd of God's Spring isn't the only traditional Shetland air that is supposedly derived from the music of the trows. Um, this recently came up on uh, the BBC um, Radio Scotland's um, outdoor program on a Saturday morning, uh, where they explored the idea that maybe all of the sort of best known Shetland reels are derived from music that came from the trows. So I've got a few more of these trows, uh, tunes, trowy tunes, and the story behind them, but I'll start with the only one trowy reel that comes from Unst, from my home island. So that's called Valafield. Um, so well, let's read the story out first, if we can find it. <clears throat> okay. So it was more common to hear of the fairies than to see them. One November day, early in the 19th century, Sandy Winnick of the Westing, Unst, set out four miles to Colverdale to play a uh, long-promised visit to his boyhood friend, Andrew Manson. Time passed pleasantly chatting about boyhood exports, uh, exploits, and in the afternoon of the following day, Sandy thought it was time to start for home. After mutual blissings, they parted at the hill grind, and uh, Sandy set out on his tramp over the hills. Dusk had fallen when he uh, crossed the south end of Valafield, that's a hill on the um, uh, west side of Unst. But as he had only half a mile further to go, he stopped to have a smoke in the shelter of Gulliohammer, a steep rock face on the west side of the hill. He was about to produce his uh, tinderbox when the sound of music was borne to his ears. He sat spellbound, and only when it dawned on him this was unearthly music did a cold chill of fear creep down his spine. As he jumped to his feet, he grabbed his pocket knife, and as his fingers touched the steel, the music ceased. He raced across the valley, his heart beating a rhythm as fast as that of the tune, and he did not pause or look back until he came to the hill dyke. Nothing could be seen or heard. Proceeding home at a more sober pace, he told the story to his family as soon as he got in and sang the tune to his daughter. It was she who played it on the fiddle and gave the Westing a new tune called Valafield, the only known music of the sprightly trows of Unst. So very similar story comes from Eighth uh, on the Shetland mainlet, and I have a bit of the audio here of uh, Charlie Simpson telling the tale before I play the tune itself. About the year 1790, a Coningsboro carpenter had been celebrating the beginning of a new sixerman, and he was staggering home in the early hours of the morning around the head of Hadesville. And at the head of the wall, he was suddenly aware of the sound of music coming through the Green Canal, at the side of the Piri Burn that runs into the head of the hole. Now he was a knotted fiddler, so he began to pay attention to the music, and of course he was full of Dutch courage, so he slapped it forward to the canal. When he got there, the music was coming from the inside. So he travelled around in the moonlight till he came to the Piri door, opened it a Piri bit with each he was carrying, and he was amazed, for they were a tow's dancing full swing, and the fiddler playing this lively succeed melody. Who long he listened he did not tell, but it might be that the tow's dancing tune that he named Dade's Rant has in it the clink of the same and the row, the splashing of the burn, the pleasant pretty sounds that one hears and ebb on a still night, all metamorphosed into a vivacious magic. With the fumes of good aqua vitae. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, 
Moving on. Hell to dance. It's a ring of stones on a hill on Fettler, which is the island that's just to the south and uh, east of Unst. And it's supposed to mark the place where trows would come on moonlit nights and dance. There's a tune called Hill to Dance, which is supposedly heard at that place one night. I've got a little bit of audio of the Fettler storyteller, James J. Lawrenson, which some of you may not have a little bit of trouble understanding, but I hope you'll, you'll, you'll manage to um, uh, understand it. And it describes how the t tune was heard. Now, the st what is the story connected with that, then? Is there a story? Oh, well, 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 the story connected with it, and, and there's supposed to be a, a, a place of ceremony, and that's pity folk. But they had to watch, and the sun didn't rise on them, mm -hmm. and then th that was a bad business for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they maybe killed them, and notwithstanding, they had to do all sorts, of, uh, and that was bad if the sun rose. So they had to watch and be out clear of it before the sun rose. Mm -hmm. And the young, the younger, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the smaller people, had musical they would have, have run, run around the place and, and make sort of music of their own. And, and uh, fortunately, my, my grandmother handed, was able to hand down, oh yes, well, that there were a man, the Gableton uh, of, of Fear, was supposed to be the first to hear the tune. Mm -hmm. And he was going to Stocks, that's at East Hill, to the, the Craigs. And a common hand for the Greeks, he was doing, actually, he was being the Greek. And he had this music, and he was very interested, and he was able to hand it down. Mm -hmm. Gableton of Fear. Mm -hmm. And you keen the music, do you? And I, well, I've heard it, but I'm not sure that I know it. Oh, know do you it. not? You can, could you sing it? Uh, I could do it. Yes, yeah. my grandmother, Charlie, though, was a great uh, historian, yeah. and a musical person, so she could sing it. Yes, yes. And he goes, Three, three, little daddle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, daddle, dow, 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 deedle, daddle, three, three, little daddle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, daddle, I repeat it, dow, 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 deedle, daddle, three, three, little daddle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, dow, deedle, daddle. Yes, and that was all it was over. That was all of the people, and the cat, you the three little. She had the name the the title Dead Lullaby, the uh, Halter Dance. Yes, yes, the Halter Dance. Yes. Yeah, that's what he he named. I see. Well, I mean, that's a most interesting story then. Yeah. And, and when when they're uh, uh, but, uh, but so, as you may have heard there, the trows were not supposed to be caught by the rising sun. In various stories, they should trap them above ground until the following night, or even turn them to stone. Some people have uh, suggested that Hilted Dance stones, which will. Or after the tune. So yeah, this is the Hilt the Dance Stone Ring that's up on that hill. Um, so we heard the tunes there. So there's maybe a lot of similar stories about uh, trows or uh, being caught in the sun and uh, turned to stone. So the last trowy tune I have here. Oh, wait a minute. One thing before. Um, I was at New Year uh, Hogmanay party uh, on Fettler a few years ago and there was a fiddler, a local fiddler there, and I tried to ask him about trowy tunes. He wasn't particularly interested in sort of uh, coming up with any, but I think he played possibly the Hill to Dance one to me. So um, so the last thing we have here is the Winya Delpa, um, or Winya Depla even, sorry. I'm going to mispronounce it. I think well, I got it. I've got it written wrong here on the, on the slide. It's Winya Depla. And the story of its origin goes like uh, this. If I can find it. <clears throat> so it's from Fettler 2 that we have the old tune of Winya Win Depla. 
There was one winter in 1803 that Gibby Lawrenson, living at Norderhus Gruten, set out with a mare's load of dried corn for grinding at the uh, Ferva water mill. After he'd filled the hopper and started the mill, he lit a peat fire in a tea kettle, a fire kettle, and sat down on a stool to rest. Aware of voices outside, Gibby pretended to be asleep, as he knew then that the trousers were about. The door opened and a troop of fairy folk, pretty folk came in. A woman took off the nappy from her baby and hung it on Gibby's leg near the fire to dry. Then one of the trous said, What do we do to this sleeper? Latimeline, replied the woman. He's no ill body. Tell Shanko to give him a tune. Said Shanko, a tune he shall hay, and we'll drink his bland. So bland is um, uh, half fermented, like buttermilk, um, but a little bit stronger than buttermilk. After drinking, they traipsed out of the mill and danced on the green out, uh, nearby. When the footfalls and music ceased, Gibby looked out from the mill door and saw the fairies going up the hill towards Stackerberg and a boat with two rowers pulling away from the shore. He concluded that this has landed his visitors. Gibby's fiddler son, to whom he whistled the tune, called it Father's Tune, but it was later named Winya Depla after a lock near the Fervau water mill. So, where are the trows? You've heard some of the stories about the trows and their actions in the past. Of course, they're seen far less now, often nowadays, though my sister once swore she saw one at the side of the road as we drove through Unslate one night. Another explanation was that it was a murit yao with her eyes growing, glowing in the headlamps. There is the idea that the trows fed the isles before the onslaught of Presbyterian preachers who made such a racket that they decided to move en masse to the Faroe Islands. This is the story of the last trow on Yell, which is the island one down from us to where the uh, uh, haunted house was, if you remember. This was one of the most hid most not the most hid most trowy ha had it was in uh, that that it was in Yell. It was in a canal at Burnside in Cullivo. In a bit in time, there were a fiddler, a great repute in Colita, by the name of Robbie Anderson. And the trows would I meet him every year and invite him to play to them uh, on uh, Yule Eve. And he was always greatly dis uh, delighted with this. For although he would never, never eat or drink, um, anything that he uh, laid his hand on the course of the year prospered till then. And he thought that this was a very good bargain and he, I looked forward to going. But he never told anybody where he was being the Christmas Eve. Uh, and all the folk, all kind, wondered where Robbie had been, but he never told them at all. And he envied them, of course, of his great prosperity during the course of the year, but he just held his tongue and held, held nobody. And then there were one winter that he never saw anything of the trows, and they never met him or never invited him. And Rabbi was getting a bit alarmed about this, for he was wondering what way it, it would affect his prosperity the coming year. So one night coming brawly wheel on Fur Yule, uh, he made upon him and he summed up his courage and he good to the trow he had. And when he came there, there weren't a soul in sight, unless one old wife, and she was sitting in a dull halt at the fire, and he asked her what on earth had come of the rest of the folk that was there the last time. And she said he might ask. She said there was a minister come to Colivo, and he had that in a volubility of preaching and praying that the trows could not suffer it at all. They got no peace, and they were all had to clear out to Farah. The last one of them was gone, but she thought she was our old to start life in a new place upon the face of the earth. And she thought that she would just end her days where she was. And that was the headmost of the trows that was ever told about in North Yell. So that um, preacher <coughs> that was mentioned there was supposed to be, where is it? James Ingram. He was minister of the parish in North Yell and Fettler from 18... Uh, 
1813, 1803 to 1821. So there was a there was a, a, a similarly hellfire and damnation preacher uh, from Yell um, when when I was uh, living there, uh, who occasionally came and preached on Unst as well, uh, and I, I would have gone to Pharaohs as well, I think, if I'd heard that. So that's it for me. Um, I think when I did this before, I um, told a few more folk tales, but I think I'll I'll stop here um, and not keep everybody uh, watching this all night. Um, so for sources, things have been liberally stolen from this book, the Book of Trows, which is a collection of uh, different folklore about the Trows, um, put together by the Shetland Folklore Development Group, and it also came with a CD, which is where some of the sound files for the the music and the um, uh, storytelling came from. And the other source was this book, The or Folklore of Orkney and Shetland by uh, Ernest Marwick. So if you like this sort of thing, and I, you know, I, I said I, sometimes before I've, I've, when I've done this talk, I've um, uh, told another couple of tales. But if you like this sort of thing, I would say much better storyteller than I am is Mary Lane Robertson. She's a stand-up comic and a storyteller, and she has a, um, a channel on Twitch and we'll put the link on the, the um, Facebook group and on the show notes for this on uh, YouTube as well. And she's highly recommended. Very funny girl, as well as uh, a very f a great storyteller. So I'll say cheerio for now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stu. Very interesting talk, as I knew it would be. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed that. I hope you've used the chat function on the YouTube channel there. Even if you're watching this after the original premiere, please feel free to add any comments you like. As I say, hopefully at some point in the near future, who knows when, we'll be back to our face-to-face -face meetings. But until then, we will continue with these online meetings. So please feel free to come along. Normally the meetings cost a pound. We're not charging anything for these. But if you do feel the urge, next time you pass a, a charity box of any sort, please feel free to, to pop a pound in there on our behalf, as it were. So next month's meeting is Richard Freeman, and he's going to be answering questions, being interviewed on cryptozoology, the Centre for Fortune Zoology, some of the books he's written, and also some of the epic adventures that he's been on. So please, if you do have any questions, try and get them in quick. Get them in at least before the end of June to give us a chance to actually record the, the whole thing. If you do have questions on the night that you weren't able to ask uh, in advance, then please, again, use the comment section on YouTube and hopefully we'll be able to answer them as we go on. Thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight. Hope you've enjoyed it. Stay safe.